Michael Clam here, host of Conversations with Poets, with Katie Manning, professor, poet, mom extraordinaire. We're going to read some poems, talk about poetry, uh, discuss your work a little bit. I want to thank the San Diego Public Library. We're downtown right now. Uh, special thanks to Misty Jones and Mark Cherry. And I want to give a, a shout out to all of the staff, uh, Kent Tran, Sherwood Hartwell, and uh, Rachel Mink for the editing, uh, the video, and all of the work that you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Uh, Katie Manning, th this came about because of we have a poet laureate in San Diego now, uh, Ron Salisbury, and the Commission for Arts and Culture in the city of San Diego said, hey, let's find our poets who are extraordinary in San Diego and talk to them and see what they have to say, learn a, bit, a little bit about them, give people a chance to hear their work, uh, ask a bunch of questions and see what you guys say under pressure. Um, so first, I, with everybody, I've just kind of asked uh, to tell a little bit of history and uh, you also, you're a professor at Point Loma Nazarene University, so in telling how you became a poet and what your trajectory as a poet has been, give us a little sense of what it's like to be a poet in San Diego too. Sure, so that was a big question <laughs> and a lot of questions. So um, I could start with my origins at age four when Let's I started go. composing poems. Of course. Um, I won't maybe go back that far, but I poetry has always been just part of what I do. I fell in love with poetry at such an early age. Um, it was in college at Point Loma where I realized, oh, I can pursue this more regularly. I can work at it. It's not something I just have to do when inspiration strikes. Um, so I, I really fell in love with poetry at Point Loma as a student, and I hoped that I would someday get to come back as a professor. That was my dream job. So it was really such a gift to get to come back as soon as I did. I went off to grad school, got to do um, Kansas City, Lafayette, Louisiana, pursue poetry in those capacities. Um, and then, yeah, I eventually made my way back to Point Loma. So I'm a professor of writing. I get to teach poetry, both in creative writing classes and in literature classes and you know, talk about it with anybody who will listen or not listen. I just chase people around and talk about poetry sometimes. <laughs> um, I get to host a lot of events at Point Loma and a lot of those are open to the community as well. So I host Poetry Day in the fall and um, we invite a different guest poet in, sometimes from somewhere else, sometimes a local poet. This fall we're gonna have Gil Sotu in and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I get to host these monthly writing sessions where we get together and write for three hours silently together and those have been my favorite events because I get to write also. Nice. And yeah, so, so I get to do a lot through Point Loma. Um, and then I'd say, you know, out in the community, it's been fun to get involved just attending different readings, um, finding ways to connect with other poets in San Diego because I edit Whale Road Review, mm -hmm. I've gotten to both publish some San Diego poets and also some of the poets in San Diego have joined Whale Road Review as peer reviewers. Mm -hmm. So it's been fun to work with people in and that way too. And you created this entirely, right? I you, did, you, yeah. You, you, you authored it to, in, to a certain degree, and you do uh, mini reviews. Are your YouTube reviews part of Whale Road? No, that's a separate thing. So, so I, yeah, I was trying to write a book review at least once or twice a year, and I realized I just was falling behind and didn't have enough time to put into writing a full-length book review mm -hmm. and sending that off to you know some kind of journal. So I started doing these tiny little video reviews and putting them on YouTube, so it's usually two or three minutes long, because I read so many poetry books and I want yeah. to you know, share them with people. And so that was an easy way to do it. I can talk to my camera for two or three minutes and that's yeah. a lot faster than writing a whole book review. Yeah, so. how, how did you do all this time? Did you do some of that during COVID when you were kind of cooped up at home? Was it uh, all camera time, all screen time for you? It, it was not. So COVID mm. time was a lot of um, extra work with mm. teaching remotely, as mm. you might imagine, yeah. with my, my multiple college classes. And it was also, mm helping my children do school from home. That's so right. some people found extra time while they were home and I think I found less time <laughs> because yeah. of the extra work that we had while we were while we were doing school from home. 
Speaking of review, do you, I, a good friend of mine and mentor, uh, Steve Cowett, uh, for the San Diego Poetry, and we have a, a, mm -hmm. a Cowett Prize. I know his name. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Steve was the man. He was a great teacher, an excellent uh, a poet in every regard, and just, just, a good, just a good friend to the poetry community. And he said that when it comes to poetry, uh, let's keep the reviews positive. You know, if you're going to go negative for something you don't like, don't bother reviewing it. How do you feel about that? I have exactly the same take on it, I, right? and I tell my students that too. Yeah. That if you if you want to review something, um, I hope that it comes from a place of wanting to share it with other people. Mm -hmm. And there's no reason to burn bridges with publishers or with other writers. Right. If there's no reason to give something publicity at all if you don't enjoy it. True. Yeah. Do you have a sort of a philosophy of education or an approach to get people to write poetry? Do your students come in ready to go, just ready to write poems that are excited to, to write? Or do you have a, a sort of some methods and strategies that work? Yeah, so a lot of the students in the creative writing poetry classes mm -hmm. really do come in wanting to write. They're mm -hmm. really excited about it. Some of them come in a little hesitant. Yeah. The ones that I often have to win over are the ones who come into the gen ed literature classes and I kind of have to win them over to reading poetry, mm -hmm. and I also have them write some poetry in response to the literature that we're reading. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think for me, the way that I try to win people over is just to give a wide variety of poems mm -hmm. to read, because poetry is so large. There are so many different mm -hmm. forms. Any kind of content you can imagine is going to be in a poem somewhere. Yeah. So, so I think that people who don't know that they like poetry just haven't found the right yeah. poems yet. For sure. It, there, so there's no part of the poetry genre, genre that you stay away from because it is very diverse. And you have Gil Soto come in, you know, and Gil's uh, he's a slam poet. He's very yeah. much uh, off the page, you know, talking to the audience, poet, engaging people. Mm -hmm. Uh, poet, is there anything in the genre that you kind of stay away from? Too much language poetry, or I am delighted. <laughs> I, there, there are poems probably that I wouldn't prefer myself, but I'm delighted that they exist. Yeah, I, I love that poetry is large enough for all of us. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I often think of poetry in terms of a menu. I've described, you know, reading submissions a for Whale Road menu. Review like this. Uh, you know, there's this whole menu of items, and just because I have chosen, you know, the ice cream sundae mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the apple pie isn't wonderful. It mm -hmm. just means that I felt like an ice cream sundae today. Right. Um, so, I mean, I think of poetry like that. There's so much goodness, and I might not like some of the flavors, but I'm still happy they're mm -hmm. there because other people are going to love those. Yeah, I've spoken to a number of poets already uh, for conversations with poets, and they all say the same thing about reading. Mm -hmm. And some of the poets, they get up in the morning and they don't start with the laptop or the pen, they open a collection. Mm -hmm. So what do you collect? Do you have a whole section? Like we're in on the fourth floor right now, mm -hmm. and the poetry section's over there. Do you have a spot in the house or in the office where, where you kind of find inspiration in your, in your stacks? I, I have multiple spots. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have most of my poetry books at school in my office, but um, I at home, I have a section in my bedroom on a shelf. I have a section in my home office. Yeah. Um, and then there are very special books that sit on my desk. Yeah. Um, the ones that I return to or the ones yeah. that I need in that moment um, oh, yeah. sit next to me, me on too, my right desk. Me too, right by the bed. I've got mm -hmm. a, few a few right by the bed. Yeah. Cowards, yeah. Uh, his Maverick Poets is right by the bed, as a matter of fact. So you would yeah. teach as much, uh, you would uh, launch a Charles Bukowski poem, but also launch a Ray Armand Trout poem, right? You would you take it all over the place with your with your students. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I like a I like to give them a wide variety so yeah. that they can find the things that they connect with, and then hopefully pursue those, yeah. find more work by those poets, or find more work that's you know that's similar that they are also going to yeah. love. And I'll often recommend more things for my students when they do right. find things that they love. Yeah, and this is it, right? There's the side of poetry that you know you want it to be accessible. You want people to like it. We all want an audience. As a writer, you want an audience. You want people to like the genre, mm -hmm. right? But I think you're probably right. There would be a lot of students who would come in and want to see some structure and give it a go, write a sonnet, that kind of thing. And you like Rita Dove, yeah? I do. I yeah. love Rita Dove. Uh, would you read? Uh, she's one of your, is she one of your mentors? Something. Why, why, what do you like about Rita Dove? 
I, oh, I love so many things about Rita Dove. I love that she has reinvented herself so many times. Her reading a Rita Dove book is never the same experience. Mm. So she's gone through so many different phases in her writing. Mm. And the thing that I am gonna read today, Daystar, is from her book, Thomas and Beulah, which is based on her maternal grandparents. And I love in that collection that she wrote about people who are entirely ordinary. And she wrote about some of the most basic sorts of things that you can write about, just everyday life kind of situations. Mm -hmm. And they're fascinating mm. because we're fascinating to each other. And, and it's something that I talk to my students about too. Sometimes we think, oh, I can't write about myself or I can't write about my family because that's too boring. Nobody's mm. gonna wanna read about that. And it's absolutely the opposite. You know, uh. we are so fascinating to each other. We might be bored of ourselves, but other people are going to find those stories really yeah. fascinating. It's easy too, I think, to hear a poet read a poem that's invented as opposed to a poem that came from true experience. Mm -hmm. And where is real life happening? It's happening in your house with your family for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did she win a Pulitzer Prize? Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Thomas and Beulah won the Pulitzer Prize in 1987. And you're gonna win, you're gonna read a poem from that collection, Yes, right? yes, this is Daystar. She wanted a little room for thinking but she saw diapers steaming on the line, a doll slumped behind the door. So she lugged a chair behind the garage to sit out the children's naps. Sometimes there were things to watch, the pinched armor of a vanished cricket, a floating maple leaf. Other days she stared until she was assured when she closed her eyes, she'd only see her own vivid blood. She had an hour at best before Liza appeared pouting from the top of the stairs. And just what was mother doing out back with the field mice? Why, building a palace. Later that night, when Thomas rolled over and lurched into her, she would open her eyes and think of the place that was hers for an hour, where she was nothing, pure nothing, in the middle of the day. You write a lot about uh, being a mom. Do you uh, have this experience where you need to find your own moment, your own space? Because at any moment, there's gonna be something to sabotage your peace. <laughs> I, I do, I do feel it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the really different circumstances. And, and that's something that I love that poetry does. The details of this poem mm. aren't my details. Mm -hmm. um, I have sons, I don't have diapers steaming on a line, mm. there's not a doll slumped on the door, and yet right. those details connect me to this, this woman that I'm mm. reading about. Um, and I do know that experience of the sort of relentlessness of mothering. Right. And right. It, there's the joy, there's, they're wonderful, and yet there is this kind of, this sense that there is not a break. Um, and yeah. it can be overwhelming sometimes. Indeed. So yeah, you do have to create those spaces of rest and those yeah. moments of solitude yeah. in the midst of all of that. When you can stop and go out into the world and remember that the world is still happening in that moment, she's the vanished cricket, a floating maple leaf. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was down at the beach this morning and there was a couple walking across with two girls and one of the girls took a toy from the girl that was in dad's arms and the little girl in his arms started screaming and I heard someone over here next to me say, oh, poor baby. And I was like, oh, parents are probably thinking, oh, I know my child. I know what just happened. This is life. This happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Parents have to deal with this kind of thing constantly. Be hard to, you know, not want a moment uh, to yourself, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, and you write quite a bit in your last collection, your most recent collection, you write quite a bit about family as well. And that's the, your family now, but also a family that's passed. Mm -hmm. Would you read something out of your new collection for us? Absolutely. Yeah, so I brought the title poem from my newest chapbook, which is 28,065 Nights. And that is a collection that I wrote to and about my granny who passed away a few years ago. So this is 28,065 Nights. I tell your stories to keep myself alive. I tell you new stories. 
I speak them aloud to you when no one is around, the way you used to talk to Grandpa in your bedroom after his death. The stories play on repeat in my head. I write them down. I tell them to Elliot when he asks. A year later, he still remembers you, but I don't know how long his memories from two will last. To him, you will be more story than person. Are we always more story than person? Words thicker than water? I got the wave of your hair and your lack of wisdom teeth. I did not get your metabolism that let you eat six hot dogs at one cookout, but I get to keep that story more necessary now than blood or breath. And uh, so 28,065 nights, I did the math. This is uh, 76.890411 years. Good job doing the yeah, math. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. I should be a mathematician. <laughs> Let it not be said that poets can't do math. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Do you um, feel that kind of uh, connection to your uh, ancestors, your grandma, and uh, do you sort of carry on the, that with your family, but also in your poetry, the life that they lived? Yeah, my granny uh, was kind of my other mother when mm -hmm. I was young. Um, my mom was very young, and so my granny stayed home and mm -hmm. took care of me. Um, and she is the one who wrote down the first poem that I composed when I was four and mm. couldn't write it down myself. Grandma. And so, so yeah, we were very, very close. Um, and so when she passed away, it was, you know, earth shattering. And, yeah. and so I found myself wanting to record her life and trying to figure out how can I, how can I keep her in some way or how can I pass her along to my kids. And I had a, a really um, more ambitious idea of what I could do and I realized pretty quickly there's no way I can write out all of her life, right? There's no, and, and I don't even know all of the details I would need to write out all of her life. But the thing that I can capture is our relationship and the stories that she told me, mm -hmm. the things that I wish I could tell to her now. And so, so that was what I did. I started writing to her mm -hmm. um, and sort of also about her. And in some ways it felt silly to me to tell her stories back to her, except that that's what you do in families. Mm -hmm. You end up sometimes telling the same stories over and over to each other. And so, it, it was kind of fun to think about the nature of storytelling mm -hmm. and how stories connect us sometimes more than anything else that we do, even mm -hmm. sometimes more than biology, right? I mean, mm -hmm. more than our blood. It's, it's the stories that we tell Are we that more story reinforce, than person? Yeah. yeah, and those reinforce our relationships, our connections with each other. Indeed, your recollection of the past changes the past. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, you write. I wanted to ask you a little bit about structure in uh, 28,065 nights. Uh, somebody would open this book and see blocks, not lines. Yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your choice to write these almost, they almost look like vignettes. Yeah, so I am fascinated by prose poems or the blurry boundary between genres. Mm. So there's the prose poem or short micro essay, lyric essay kind of space, mm -hmm. sometimes blurring with flash fiction, although in this collection, we're definitely walking the boundary between prose poetry and micro essay. Mm -hmm. And some of the pieces in this collection were published as creative nonfiction. They went out to magazines and journals and were published as, um, as short essays. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I love the blurriness of that. For me, I, I, there were some of the pieces that I kind of started to play with in lineation, but it felt wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that part of it is, at least my, my take on prose poetry, is that when things are more weighty, sometimes a prose poem can hold that and line breaks almost make it feel melodramatic mm -hmm. because the line breaks can add so much weight mm -hmm. to certain words and phrases. So, so yeah, the prose poem form seemed to fit what I was working with here. What do you say to a student who comes in and is expecting to see stanzas in white space and line breaks? 
Well, I, my students get to work with this quite a bit because I, I present to them. They're like, great, we can <laughs> just go margin to margin. <laughs> Some of them margin love right that, margin. yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I do have students who get very excited yeah. to realize, especially Structure if they're... Structure doesn't get in the way. Yeah, especially if my students who are, are coming from a background where they've written more fiction and nonfiction, it does make poetry more accessible to them. Mm -hmm. And it really does get us into, you know, it's not the line breaks that define a poem. There Tell are more story. things going on mm -hmm. in a poem. So what are the other features that make us go, yeah, this is a poem. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've read a poem. Because mm. um, it's not only the line breaks. True. There are other things going on with I sound agree. and language and image and yeah. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely with you. You have a poem too called um, Choosing a Moon. We read I that do. One for I would us? love to read that one. I want to hear that poem. That one just yeah. got published too, right? It's it was just accepted for publication a few days ago. And what's yeah. the publication? Tell us. Pyrene's Fountain. Pyrene's Fountain. Yeah, it's associated with Glass Liar Press. It's a pretty cool publication. So, um, this is a poem that I just wrote in March as part of the Ruminate Happenings fundraiser. Ruminate. So I wrote it on the spot with people watching me live on mm. camera, which is terrifying and exciting. It is was this really the fun. same, what you wrote? You made it's no close. changes? It's close. I made some little tweaks afterward. So it it's, it's kind of work. lightly, yeah. oh yeah, I, I couldn't. It is important. <laughs> yes, I always, a little revision is, is good. So this is Choosing a Moon, and the epigraph is, I think everybody in the poetry community deserves their own moon from Todd Dillard. Choosing a Moon. Who can resist the pull of Ganymede, the only moon in the solar system with its own magnetic field, named for the most beautiful boy? And don't most of us make the mistake of taking whatever is largest, a slice of cake, or most lovely, that gorgeous boy, even when we know they're not the best for us? Then I leap to the other extreme, I think of Deimos, smallest moon of Mars, the eight-mile ball I could keep in my cosmic pocket. But who wants to carry even the smallest amount of dread? Then I turn to Io, and my mouth keeps turning the vowels over and over. How could I resist the liquid sounds that label the driest object in our solar system? How can I help but see myself in one of the few mortal women beyond this earth? What woman doesn't contradict herself and burn? The lava lakes call to my tongue. Io, this is the one. Io's like 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hot. It's a hot moon. It is. Yeah. Lava lakes, man. Lava I mean, lakes and volcanoes. It's yeah. a volcano moon, right? Yeah. 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 Fire. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> we go with heat. People think of moons as cold dark side places. It, you know? it defies our, our platonic form of a moon. Yeah, <laughs> I like Iapetus. It's a, it's a moon that um, orbits uh, Saturn. Uh -huh. And it was discovered by Cassini and that little satellite that NASA made that ended its life by plowing into the atmosphere yes. of Saturn. Took all these beautiful pictures of this moon and it's called the yin and yang moon because it's got a real dark side, it's got uh -huh. a real more hot side, it's got a real cool side. And they're that. trying to figure out why, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so now you cool. need to write a poem for that moon. I, I'm yeah. telling you right now, I have to do it. I want to be on screen doing it just yeah, like you. Yeah, it's a good prompt. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so do you, um, uh, you know, when he says, uh, Todd Dillard says, I think everybody in the poetry community deserves their own moon. Uh, do you uh, do uh, it, do you think that everybody can become a great poet? Do you believe that that's true? Is it is it something that comes natural? You have to work at it. Are some people sort of uh, born into it, or is it a little bit of everything? Do you think some folks should just do something else? I mean, I think that it, like any art or sport or you know, anything that requires skill, you know, there might be people who are more inclined to be poets, people mm -hmm. who naturally love language or love playing with sound or um, enjoy reading poetry or, you know, so some people might be more naturally inclined, mm -hmm. but even those people are going to need to work at it. Sure. Um, and some people who don't fall in love with poems at age four 
could still work at it and could mm -hmm. still certainly become poets and, and do quite well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think maybe less so than someone who plays basketball and might need to actually be a certain height to be great. <laughs> I think yeah. poetry is maybe a bit more accessible. If you think um, of it as a sport, you absolutely. can do this until the day you die. Absolutely, right. you can right. be great until the day you die. Yeah, but, yeah. but painters have to work at painting. Mm -hmm. Photographers have to take a lot of bad photos before, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I mean, all of us have to work at our arts or our sports or whatever it is. If you're cooking, you have to make a lot of really awful dishes before mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be skilled enough with the tools of the art that you're working at, right? So, sure. so I think that's true of poetry. I think mm -hmm. all of us have to work at it and continually improve ourselves. And, and I think we're all hoping to work to be something that someone else will call great. If we're calling ourselves uh -huh. great, that's probably Maybe too much, but <laughs> I say why not? It's right. History is in mean, the retelling. Yeah, yeah. it was fantastic. <laughs> this conversation was amazing. Yeah. For, yeah. for it's, sure, it's good to have a you know some good confidence about mm -hmm. yourself. But Indeed. yeah, but, but you should work at it, right? Yeah. yeah, and read and know what you know. Know what's out there. That's great for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, know your community. Know your poets, right? Absolutely. Well, Katie Manning, I want to thank you very much for doing the interview with us for conversations with poets and thank you. Uh, thank you for all that you do in San Diego. Uh, check out uh, the poetry reviews. Tell us again what is your poetry reviews called? Whale Road called? Review. Whale Road Review yeah. and, uh, and your new book is uh, 28,065 Nights and in there you're going to find poetry that does not come in chunks, stanzas. You're going to find blocks that will uh, give you some insight into Katie Manning's world. Uh, thank you so much once again for being here with us and thanks to the San Diego Public Library for letting us have conversations with poets. Thank you.